In a world where the climate is out of control, one technology might save the planet, but it carries terrifying risks of its own. Two men are here now with the information we need. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make the future. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world, featuring the voices of Daniel Valenzuela, Jose Kuhani, and Michael Curry. Also featuring Michael Oloranimo and Sarah Palin. Music and editing, Christian Peltonen. This episode's future trend discussion topic, climate engineering, with Dr. Jason Blackstock and Dr. Will Burns. Brought to you by Fling.Asia, urban drone delivery. Get it fast, fling it, fling! Welcome to Let's Make the Future. I'm Daniel Valenzuela. I'm very excited to discuss our topic today, climate engineering, because it has the potential to impact the future of the planet in a way that no human scale technology intends to. Helping us to discuss this topic are our guests, Dr. Jason Blackstock, Senior Lecturer in Science and Global Affairs of University College London, and Dr. Will Burns, Co-Director of the Forum of Climate Engineering Assessment. Dr. Blackstock, could you please introduce your background as it relates to climate engineering? Sure, Daniel. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So my background in terms of education includes a background in physics and in politics. I did my PhD in physics and then did a master's of public administration. And while I was coming out of my education and looking at ways to leverage both areas, the technical area as well as the interest in policy, it really drew me into the world of energy and climate change. And at the time, around 2006-7, climate engineering or geoengineering, as it's often referred to, was just starting to to emerge from many years of dis background discussion, but really emerge into a topic of conversation as being a potential response to the rapid rate of climate change that we're seeing and expecting for the future. And so in the early days of geoengineering starting to become a bit more mainstream, I was involved in some of the initial work by places like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other groups such as the Novum Group in doing technology assessments of the possibilities and then increasingly working on the governance of climate engineering. I haven't been as involved in the last few years as we've sort of hit a plateau of evolution on the science of geoengineering in many ways. And now it's really become more of a political discussion or a conversation about where the policies and politics might go. But in the current era, that hasn't progressed nearly as fast. But I know that links strongly to the excellent work that Will and colleagues are now doing. So hopefully that's a bit of a segue for him. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks Dr. for that segue. Dr. Burns, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. So my background educationally is in international environmental law. And I've spent probably the last 25 years or so focused primarily on climate change issues. And I came into geoengineering about the same time that Jason did as, as interest in these technologies began to be discussed in earnest around 2007. And when I was at Johns Hopkins University running a program a few years after that, it became increasingly obvious that the focus on geoengineering had increased largely as a result of our despair about potentially passing critical climatic thresholds. And at that point, I became interested in developing a think tank that would ensure that not only would we have a technocratic discussion about geoengineering issues, but we'd also look at some of the social issues and then try to ensure participation by all potential stakeholders. And this had come largely out of my work previously on the impacts of climate change on small island states and the fact that there can be disproportionate impacts in terms of climate change and similarly potentially disproportionate impacts in terms of some of the geoengineering options that we're looking at. So I and Simon Nicholson at American University established the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment to look at both governance issues and to try to foster public participation on these issues. And it's now based at American University. Okay, thank you very much. Um, also, welcome to the show. I really like that counterweight to the technocratic view. I think that's great work. Thank you very much. 
So Wikipedia tells me that climate engineering, which is commonly referred to as geoengineering, what we'll talk about today, also known as climate intervention, is the deliberate and large-scale intervention in the Earth's climatic system with the aim of affecting adverse and global warming. We'll talk more in detail about that. Now in the first part, we will kind of try to structure this discussion in three parts or three lenses, if you wish. First, we're going to talk about techniques. This will be more the engineering perspective. Then we're going to talk about politics how this is politically realizable, what the political implications and political landscape at the moment say about this, and then the traction. So how will this actually will look like in potentially a few years? I would love to hear just a bit of a background, or especially for our audience less familiar with climate engineering, on what some of the most plausible techniques might be enumeration of some of the most likely or plausible climate engineering techniques to not only slow down the damaging effects of climate change, but also even reverse it. So it's an excellent question, Michael. Let me start by just making sure that there's a fundamental understanding of what's driven the climate problem, because I think that will help understand the two different ways of thinking about geoengineering or the two broad categories of geoengineering or climate engineering techniques. The emission of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 into the atmosphere, ends up trapping heat on our planet. It's the the amount of sunlight that comes into the planet stays exactly the same, but it's kind of like wrapping the planet in a blanket that ends up trapping some of that heat and warming us up. And as a result, most of the focus around climate change and reducing climate change or limiting it for the future is about limiting the amount of CO2 we put up in the atmosphere, basically how thick that CO2 blanket gets, how much heat we trap. Now, there are two broad categories of climate engineering technologies that are out there. The first, and these are more technical names, but the first is carbon dioxide removal, CDR. And it is what it says on the tin. It's about, we've put up this CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're continuing to put up a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere from burning coal, from burning fossil fuels, from deforestation, etc. And as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, the whole idea of CDR is, well, can we suck it out again? And I'll come back in a minute to talk about that in relation to mitigation, because like when you're filling up a bathtub, if you're filling up a bathtub really fast and you open up a small drain on the bottom that sucks a little bit out, but you're putting more in than you're taking out the bottom, you're overall not having a big effect on how much you're adding. So while carbon dioxide removal is an approach to geoengineering, it's something that's definitely being explored. The very fact that we continue to put so much CO2 into the atmosphere right now, there's a big debate about whether it's worth even thinking about removing it from the atmosphere until we've transitioned away from putting it up there to begin with. So there's often a conversation that goes, well, there are more cost-effective ways to stop building coal plants and to stop emitting CO2 from burning of fossil fuels when you can switch towards electric vehicles that are using renewable energy and renewable energy to power all of our electricity systems. And so on one side of climate engineering, there's these technologies that may be useful far in the future to reduce climate change and even, as you put it, Michael, reverse some of the effects that we've already started to feel and will feel more in the future. But that's a long time scale. We have to stop emitting the CO2 in the first place and then start vacuuming it, sucking it out of the atmosphere. And it'll take a long time, decades, to suck out enough to make a real difference. Now, that's one type of climate engineering technology. The other type of climate engineering technology doesn't focus so much on the cause, which is the CO2 in the atmosphere, but rather on trying to reduce the amount of energy coming into the atmosphere in the first place. So as I mentioned, climate change driven by CO2 doesn't reduce the amount of sunlight that comes into the atmosphere and heats up our planet. But there are techniques called, again, technical terms, solar radiation management, SRM, or solar geoengineering, which essentially is about turning down the sun, for lack of a better phrase. It's about reducing slightly the amount of solar energy that comes through our atmosphere and gets absorbed by the planet to heat it up. And there are a variety of techniques out there that have been thought about from putting big mirrors in space to basically giant reflectors. But the most effective way that's been considered is to put small particles in the upper atmosphere, basically little droplets. And those little droplets act as tiny little mirrors that reflect sunlight back into space. Now, in order to do that, there are two techniques that have been commonly talked about. One which mimics volcanoes. So when large volcanoes erupt, it can put a lot of sulfur into the upper stratosphere, turns into tiny little particles, and those particles reflect sunlight away. Another way is clouds themselves are just water droplets. And there have been experiments that have tried to look at, can you create essentially slightly bigger, slightly brighter clouds to be more reflective? 
Now, the advantage of these types of solar techniques are as soon as you turn down the amount of energy that comes in, you've turned down the temperature of the planet. So rather than taking decades to slowly remove carbon, it can potentially have an impact the very year that you put those particles up. And we've actually seen historically in 1992 when Mount Pinatubo erupted and dumped a whole bunch of sulfur into the upper stratosphere, that turned into uh, small particles that lasted for about a year and a half. And we saw about a half degree centigrade dip in the global average temperature the following year as a result. So we know in principle it can work. We've never done an engineered version of it. And there's all sorts of questions about side effects and who controls it and whatnot. But I'm guessing that's where we're going in the next set of questions. <laughs> that's right. I'm excited to talk about side effects. But I guess this whole conversation revolves around the costs and the benefits here of the technologies. So thanks for explaining that. First of all, we have CDR, carbon dioxide removal, that may be applicable much later on, and solar radiation management, which I think I've certainly heard a lot more about in the media. And it almost seems to be synonymous with climate engineering in that it's really applicable right now. I guess the next question that I think might help us to calibrate our later conversation on the politics, what is the worst case scenario if we choose to do climate engineering techniques? The first caveat that I would have on this, especially in the context of solar radiation management techniques, we have very little practical knowledge to make those assessments at this point. Most of these things, such as sulfur aerosol injection that Jason had referred to, have largely been modeled in the laboratory. There's some discussion now of small-scale field experiments, including potentially in Arizona next year. But to date, we're relying largely on the same kind of global circulation models that have some problems when it comes to assessing uh, climate impacts, especially when we get to the regional level. But with that in mind, we do have some research that indicates what some of the potential risks are of these approaches. I'd start with the SRM side, uh, solar radiation management. In terms of sulfur aerosol injection, some research has indicated that sulfur aerosol injection at large scale, if you we're going to put 10 to 15 teragrams of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere annually, which may be necessary to return temperatures back to where they were in pre-industrial levels, for example, you could substantially increase evaporation and decrease precipitation, especially in certain regional areas such as South Asia and in the tropical Amazonian areas. In South Asia, this potentially could imperil the operation of the monsoon in certain years. And we have some reason to believe that there's empirical evidence of that too. Jason had referred to Mount Pinatubo and how it drastically reduced temperatures within a year. We also saw the lowest stream flow of the Ganges River the year after Mount Pinatubo occurred, leading us to believe that that's one potential serious impact. And the monsoon is a phenomena that a billion people rely on in terms of food production. So that's one issue. Proponents, on the other hand, argue that if we did it at a lower scale and didn't aim to return our temperatures back to pre-industrial levels, but just to hold temperatures at current levels, for example, we might not see that impact. We also might see reduced runoff because of reduced temperatures. And so the jury remains out on that issue. A second potential threat is by putting large amounts of sulfur into the stratosphere, we might increase the substrates that could be used to break down the ozone layer by the ozone depleting substances that are found in the stratosphere, potentially delaying replenishment of the ozone layer by somewhere between 50 and 70 years, which could result in a massive additional number of cases of skin cancer. And again, proponents argue that that sulfur would diffuse some of the incoming ultraviolet B radiation and offset that impact, but we don't know. And then the last potential big threat that we talk about in terms of solar radiation management is something called the termination effect. If you were to create this protective umbrella, but not simultaneously start massively ratcheting down our emissions, you'd have a large buildup of carbon dioxide in the interim. And then if you terminated the use of these technologies, either because some country threatened you because there were adverse impacts, such as India, for example, or if the technology simply did not work any longer, what would happen is you'd have a very large pulse of warming that would occur very rapidly thereafter. Some studies say you could see as much as five to six degrees Celsius temperature increases within one to two decades after terminating the use of these technologies, which would make it almost impossible, for example, for ecosystems to adapt. 
And then very quickly on the other side, carbon dioxide removal, one of the approaches that we're looking at most is something called BECS, bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration. So burning large amounts of bioenergy feedstocks such as forests or dedicated crops or residues to produce energy and then capturing it in the flue gas and then storing it underground or in the world's oceans. One of the major problems in this context is getting the bioenergy feedstocks at scale. If you were to do it at the scale that was large enough, you might need 7 to 25 percent of the net primary productivity of the world to do that. And that might mean diverting large amounts of cropland, for example, which could result in very substantial increases in food prices and deny some of the world's most vulnerable people's food or certainly substantially decrease caloric intake. Also, to use BECS at that scale might require as much water as all the water we use currently for irrigation and also could have huge ecosystem impacts, especially because we'd be diverting large amounts of forest land. One study said it might be as much as the equivalent of 2.8 degrees Celsius in temperature increases. So there's lots of potential risks associated with these things. But as you suggest, the only way to look at this perhaps is comparatively. What are the impacts of a business as usual scenario? And that's very difficult to assess for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not certain that that's the correct question to ask. In fact, I think it's a bit of a dangerous question because one of the things that I worry about is those that are advocates of geoengineering say that those are our options. It's either what's business as usual, if we continue to party like it's 1999 in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, (laughs) or use geoengineering. I think there's a third way, which is to substantially increase our efforts to decarbonize the world's economy. And people like Mark Jacobson at Stanford, for example, albeit with controversial research, says we could decarbonize through using things such as solar, wind, potentially by 2035 through 2050. But we need to substantially step up those efforts. So that might be the relevant question is comparing geoengineering to a radical decarbonization. But in terms of business as usual scenarios, it's very difficult to make those comparisons because some of the impacts that we're talking about in terms of geoengineering may occur in some regional areas disproportionately, whereas the impacts of a business as usual scenario in terms of climate change may occur in other areas. And it's very difficult at this point, especially with the rudimentary amount of research we have on geo, to accurately make those assessments. So thanks for that comprehensive rundown of the risks. The scariest one in my books is what you call the termination effect, which sounds pretty scary to me, even if I don't hear anything else about it. So I'd like to actually touch upon what you mentioned there, which is the scarce amount of research that currently exists, or the relatively perhaps scarce amount of research that exists, because in his introduction, Jason mentioned that the science of geoengineering may have hit a plateau recently, and now it's over to the side of politics. But I have to ask, is it possible that we could somehow increase our ability to model the climate accurately? in the next few years? Or will we always have to make a decision about whether to deploy geoengineering techniques or climate engineering techniques in this framework of great uncertainty? For example, would greater computing power, AI techniques, would these sort of things coming on stream, would this help us to decrease the range of possibilities in our models concerning the climate and humans' impact upon it, intentional or otherwise? Because hearing about the range of those possibilities, if I was a politician, I mean, it would be pretty hard to convene an urgent sort of Montreal protocol type conference to get rapid action to agree to do some kind of climate engineering technique in the climate of uncertainty that seems to exist. I'm not sure who wants to take that question, but please go ahead. Yeah, I'll take an initial stab at it, Will, and then and then jump in. So Michael, it's an excellent question. How much do we actually know about how the climate system is responding to just what we're doing now? For example, how much do the climate models, that we'll refer to them as general circulation models, these are large computational efforts to understand the climate system, they don't all agree with themselves. We have dozens of models that are used by different research groups around the world, and we try and average those effects 
the way in which those models are built. They look back over the last two centuries of data where we have detailed data and then back through geological time to try and see how well they can capture behaviors that we've seen in the past. But these, in terms of their complexity, while they are certainly complex models, they miss a huge amount of detail. One of the most obvious ones that has been in the news over the last half decade is that none of those models captured the rate at which we saw the disappearance of the Arctic sea ice over the last half decade or decade. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Getting the dynamics, ice sheet behavior, and how fast ice will melt in particular conditions with ocean circulation patterns and atmospheric circulation patterns, that in and of itself is a scientific research project that could take dozens to hundreds of researchers a decade to figure out. And that's just one piece of the global system. So when you ask the question, are we going to make enough progress in computational power in order to be able to effectively model the planet? Well, the answer is we may in fact have that computational power available now, but that doesn't mean we have either A, enough detailed data about the behavior of each of these subsystems that are important within the global climate system, or B, enough scientific understanding about the mechanisms that go along them. So take the sea ice is such a critical example, because if you think about the north part of the planet, that bit between Canada and Russia up top, it's actually just a big bowl of water. And most of the time, it's covered in this big white sheet of ice. And historically, until the late part of the 20th century, it was white pretty much all year round, which meant that when the sun was shining on it full time for half of the year, it was just reflecting most of that light away. Now that that ice has disappeared, the dark blue water, it's kind of like switching your t-shirt from a white shirt to a black shirt in the middle of a six month sunny day. The result is you absorb a lot more energy and heat, and that energy and heat being absorbed by the planet changes the dynamics of how fast things heat up. So all of that to say, as an example, we don't understand the physics of all the different pieces of our climate. And that's something that's going to take decades to centuries for us to get to the point where we really have all of that. Even if we built a beautiful AI system, without data, AI is useless. And we don't have enough data about all of these pieces and the dynamics that go into it to build an effective model of it. And that ties back to that question that you raised about the risk-risk trade-off. I'm not sure I would quite frame it exactly the way Will did about the opponents of geoengineering or the advocates of geoengineering. I think there are quite a few scientists working on it who are in the middle ground where they're not advocates or opponents, but they're scared of how much we don't know about where climate change is taking us. And we're seeing things like the disappearance of the Arctic sea ice. We're seeing things like one in a thousand year storms showing up every 10 years now. And though that's starting to become very concerning about exactly how much damage we might expect climate change to do to the societies that we have distributed. And at the same time of all the risks that Will has articulated, at least according to the models that we're using, and again, I've given all the caveats as to why the models aren't all that accurate, but those are the ones we're using to forecast climate change. And according to those, if we started to use some of the climate engineering, particularly solar geoengineering techniques, it may lead to an avoidance of a lot of those damages, particularly for the most vulnerable populations. At the end of the day, our politicians are used to making decisions under uncertainty. In fact, they do it all the time. There's never certainty when you implement a tax plan or when you implement a change in the federal bank currency or when you implement uh, global policies to reduce poverty or any of the other things that you can think about, all of them are done with uncertainty about the impact they're going to have. I think we don't often give quite enough credit to the fact that this is not that different from many of the other policy areas that we face, with one exception. We have one planet. It's not like we're talking about tweaking something at the national level where you have a bit more control and a bit more understanding and it's tweaking something that could have significant catastrophic effects for society as a whole, whether we do something or don't do something. And that leads to a much higher stake in terms of the conversation. Thank you, Jason. And if I could just push on this, maybe, Will, you can mention if you agree or disagree with what Jason just said, but I still wonder whether, say, doubling the research budget 
of institutes devoted to studying climate engineering might have some impact on our ability to manage the probabilities and decide which technique might be better or worse. I understand that, I mean, I like your definition of a politician, uh, Jason, that it's basically to act confident in the face of no information or uncertainty. Maybe I'm paraphrasing. but, but I, 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 I can I, say I uncertainty, totally get... not no information, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. The ones yeah. that act with no information are a different breed. <laughs> yes, uh, no names, that's right. But I still wonder why there isn't impetus for a Manhattan Project style amount of funding for an issue of this importance. And if that wouldn't have some serious impact on our ability to assess the problem, perhaps Will could give us his thought on that. I mean, I think it's speculative what incremental increases in research would do, but I think it would be salutary. Even those of us who have the serious reservations about geoengineering are afraid that one of the things that's possible is that if in 20 or 30 years, for example, it's clear that we're not getting our act together in terms of mitigation and we begin to cross or come very seriously close to crossing critical climatic thresholds, we may panic and seek to deploy one of these technologies without having thoroughly assessed them. And then we may end up with a worst case scenario. And so it would make sense, I think, to try to characterize some of these technologies more than we have. One thing that's clear is that when we look at something like sulfur aerosol injection, for example, which I agree with Jason is kind of the one that's discussed the most on the solar radiation management side, it would be salutary to at least conduct small-scale field experiments to see if putting these particles in the atmosphere respond in any of the way that we think they might in terms of reflecting incoming solar radiation away. And that might give us enough insights to at least know if we should be looking at this at a larger scale beyond that to try to assess some of the potential serious risks or if it's simply not even going to do what we think at the base, which is substantially increased reflectivity. It would make sense on the carbon dioxide renewable side, for example, to try to increase our research of bioenergy sources that might not require large amounts of dedicated land. For example, some of the research at University of California, Berkeley here looks at the use of algae or other what we call second or third generation biofuel resources. If we could make substantial breakthroughs in that context, it might substantially increase the prospects for using bioenergy. Direct air capture is something we haven't talked about at all, but it's another carbon dioxide removal approach where we essentially introduce ambient air to filter systems that use things such as calcium hydroxide that capture, separate out the carbon dioxide and then store it. Direct air capture could require very little land, have very few of the, the other kind of risks we're talking about in terms of that, such as water use or biodiversity, and could dramatically change the calculus. We spend virtually nothing on that research now it would make sense for us to spend 30 to $50 million, for example, to try to determine if that's a viable approach given the implications of climate change. If I can just follow on from Will's comment for just a quick follow-up. Michael, you raised the example of a Manhattan Project, and I think that's an apt example because in all of the examples that Will talked about, what more research can do is help us understand and develop better technologies for doing something. What more research of this kind will not do is tell us what overall effect this would have on climate change. So Manhattan Project is actually a really apt example. The Manhattan Project taught us how to build the bomb. It didn't teach us anything about what radiation spread throughout the atmosphere would do. That happened after we set off the first bomb. And then we started studying that process. And so I do think that, I mean, I completely agree with everything Will said in terms of an investment of research money into developing the technologies and understanding their risks, their pros, their cons. Many of the risks Will articulated in a previous answer was specifically about risks that the technology has unintended side effects. Some of those we can test for, but none of these address that core question that you had started by asking, which is, can we reduce the uncertainty about the impact on the climate of using these technologies in the future. That's a different question. And I think it is important to disentangle them because investing in developing the technologies, we would then still need 
to experiment with the technologies at a relatively large scale to see what impacts they were having. And there's no way to avoid that challenge of it's just like when you get to drug trials, when you're developing a pharmaceutical drug, eventually you have to stick it in the human patient to see what it actually does. It doesn't matter if you tried it on monkeys or on other things, you still try it in the human being, and then you see how it works. Well, we've only got one Earth. And so that is one of the major conundrums that we're going to face in the evolution of research. It's not developing the technology where the real challenge comes. It's deciding how large the test should be to determine whether or not we want to use it permanently. Thanks very much. We've talked now a long time about engineering, which is really exciting. And before actually we go to the political part, I have one more question to wrap this up. You talked about, okay, at some point we need to start with large experiments. What evidence or what understanding regarding the impact would you need to be convinced to start a large experiment? Or also, as a sub-question, Jason was saying earlier that politics nowadays also includes more data-based evidence, I guess, for more like less understood, but more data or AI-based evidence for new regulations or kind of permissions, as we also see, for example, with autonomous driving. So the sub-question would be, Jason, you talked a lot about scientific and physical understanding that you would wish for. Would you think that an AI computed a positive outlook regarding the impact would convince you? Or do you think we always would need or wish for the scientific evidence about the understanding to actually proceed with large-scale experiments? I think there are three things I would want before starting large-scale experiments. One, the understanding of the technology that only comes from developing the technology and experimenting at small scale, so exactly the type of research that Will had articulated very well. Two, an agreement that the experiment was just that, a larger-scale experiment to run it and see what the results were how it impacted the climate system, and a willingness to look at that data that comes out in order to make a decision about whether or not to continue it. And there would have to be a careful discussion about what you measure, impact on who, when, what different groups. And the third thing is a political consensus that those measurements of what you care about should be oriented towards those who are the most vulnerable to climate change and equally the most vulnerable to the negative impacts of geoengineering. In other words, those who make less than a dollar a day, those who are subsistence farmers, etc. I don't think there's any AI simulation out there that could convince me one way or the other of those three things, because ultimately there's so much politics and values integrated into certainly the second two of them, that it is ultimately a human decision. And there isn't just a binary, oh, yes, this would look good for the planet. We should absolutely do it. Will you also want to comment on that? I think that's an excellent answer. The only thing I would add is in terms of developing the political consensus, I'd want large scale public deliberation beyond just governments, because a lot of times what counts as substantial risks for people in politics and in science are different than what are considered to be substantial risks by citizens. And citizens are entitled to both try to assess these technologies and express their opinions in a way that feeds into the political process, albeit a difficult thing to do on the kind of scale that we're talking about. But I agree with Jason in all accords on the other things. Okay, thank you very much. So this was already heading clearly to the direction of politics. So you both agree on the political basis that should be there. But now talking more about the decision making. So politically, obviously, as we discovered, this will be extremely hard problem to tackle. And also because the effects will be global, and it will be very risky and potentially very impactful. So how do you think the decision making process between different countries may look like? How should it look? And also with the light that probably the impact would be disproportionate on the Earth. Do you think there's possibilities to compensate losers and leave the planet better as a whole? Where to begin? Let me start, Daniel, by answering the question of how I think things will unfold as opposed to how I think they should unfold. And I'll come back and address that briefly. There is a certain amount of pragmatism that we need to have about the way in which these technologies, just like any other technology, will get captured by political interests one way or the other. 
there is no example of a technology in history that has emerged and not had a certain amount of capture, whether it's corporate and financial capture for private gain or political capture in terms of within nations, political interests, and ultimately in terms of national interest in international affairs. I think the first place that we're going to see, and geoengineering, and I'm just going to talk specifically here about solar geoengineering because it's a bit easier because there are large differences between the two categories in the politics. But let me focus on solar geo because that's the one that has the most potential ramifications. We didn't talk much in the science component, the technology, about the cost. And the most important thing to remember with solar geoengineering is the cost of just doing it, of just developing the technologies, could be incredibly low. Estimates from technology assessments have been on the range of a billion dollars in a year in order to put up enough sulfur to have a considerable amount of control over the amount of cooling. Now, a billion dollars sounds like a lot to you and me, but actually we've got numerous billionaires in the world who could afford this. And that is not even a rounding error in terms of the debates on most U.S. appropriation bills that go before Congress. In other words, it's incredibly small. And given that, if there is the chance for national governments to assess the risk to them that climate change is posing and make a decision about, is it worth us attempting to advocate or even potentially spending the money to do solar geoengineering to either cool the temperature down or at least hold the temperature where it is. Now, given the reality of those politics, the way I think it's going to emerge is the same way many large international political issues end up emerging. There will be a handful of countries, and whether it's the G7 size or the G20 size, you're talking about a small number of countries that represent a large fraction of the population, the vast majority of the GDP, we're going to have disproportionate influence because they're the ones who will spend the money on the technology development and who will then make decisions as to what's in their interest and advocate for it one way or the other. I think where the questions start, so that's how there's so many different scenarios that could emerge in terms of which country chooses to invest in R&D first and develop the technology. And I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know which ones will. We could all hazard guesses. But I think that's less relevant than just acknowledging that the technology will very, very likely be developed in that way to some extent. Then the question becomes, and this is where it starts to marry into the should question, is once countries decide this is in our interest, what do they do about it? Is there going to be a norm whereby the countries go, okay, this is in my interest, I'm going to start doing it, and then I'm going to tell everybody else about it, and they're just going to suffer because I've got a big military and they can't do anything about it. Not a great norm to have, but it is a norm that exists in some areas of international affairs, decreasingly so over the last 50 years on average, but we've seen a recent spike in that type of approach to international affairs and politics. Or are we going to see discussions that go, this is really in our interest, but we want to have a conversation to try and address issues, as you raised, Daniel, about the sort of how do we deal with unintended and side consequences? Do we set aside funds, basically a no-fault insurance fund, that we will not be able to attribute if we do solar geoengineering, and then we see a drought in Africa or a drought in Latin America or a drought in the Western U.S.? We are not good enough at understanding the detailed physics of the climate system that I talked about before to say, oh, because we put up this much sulfur, that's what caused that drought. But we can have a framework of no-fault insurance. In other words, we don't know if doing that caused that drought, but now somebody's suffering from a drought and we're all in it together, so we're all going to provide support to address it. Now, that's where I think things should go. In fact, they should be going there in climate change to begin with. And we have seen moves towards that in the Paris Accords and the commitment to the amount of money that would be invested by developed countries to create an adaptation fund and essentially a no-fault insurance type fund and development opportunity. There are mechanisms out there that start to look like that. But the question becomes, does geoengineering get captured as a national, this is another tool of power, just like military force and economic force, or does it become considered as part of the global commons for making the world a better place? And there is no technological answer to that. There is no magic, oh, this is the technology to develop then, not this one. It is purely a question of how we choose collectively to share ownership or not of the control. 
Daniel, do you want to jump in? No, it's just slightly shocking to hear how easily also the political part gets ridiculously complex with so many different stakeholders involved on so many levels. Thanks for the answer, Jason. I appreciate the constructive nature of it, even though there's surely a lot more to talk about at this point. But go ahead, Michael. It's true how I can imagine how difficult it would be to adequately compensate the losers. And I'm seeing a lot of analogies with the existing climate treaties where they're vulnerable to the accusation that they're basically a slush fund for for poor countries, that the money ends up in the hands of dictators in poor countries. And so I can imagine that the same complaints leveled against a treaty that compensates quote unquote losers could end up having the same problems in the case of a uh, climate engineering treaty. But nevertheless, I believe that there is a case to be made for a plausible path to make that happen. I'm squeamish about the entire concept of compensating quote unquote losers, because what does compensation mean in this case? Let's say that some of the most dire implications of sulfur aerosol injection occur. We potentially shut down the monsoon and huge amounts of people's children die as a consequence of drought. How much are we going to give them for each one of their dead children? We very blithely talk about compensation of losers in legal regimes in kind of a sterile, detached sort of way. But we're talking about human beings here in a lot of cases. Or if we imperil ecosystems in terms of bioenergy and carbon capture, how are we going to quantify the quote unquote losses of biodiversity and who are we compensating in those cases? I agree with Jason that there's a role for this if we inevitably go down this path and decide we need to. And potentially having a no negligence regime would help us to get through some of the problems of causality. But I find it unlikely that we'll do that and will probably require people to prove that, quote unquote, their harms have been created by geoengineering. And that'll be very difficult for some of the world's most vulnerable to do, especially when they face a phalanx of lawyers from the developed countries that are likely to develop these technologies. And second of all, I'm not certain that we can compensate people for some of the potential impacts that will occur in a way that would be perceived as just and equitable. I believe Haas has a question about techniques. Since our models are not good enough of understanding the climate, since we understand it is hugely complex and climate is basically the complete ecosystem of the planet in its totality. So if you want to understand the climate, you have to be able to model so many things that we are not even there, either physically, mathematically, or computationally. So since our models are not good enough, how do we know interfering using technologies like SRM? What if it cools down the planet too much? What if we enter an ice age in like 100 or 200 years? Since we just can't know, why do we not? It's, it's a danger. Maybe we can answer this question, say, yeah, we can fine tune SRM, we can know. But speaking of politics, why do we not spend more on adaptation of human beings to the changes that we could crudely predict how it's going to be? For example, we can have plants that they can make clean water out of ocean and kind of address the problem of clean water, that a big problem of climate change and farming in a planet that's getting warmer and warmer. Because I believe human beings are creatures that they can adapt very well. We have human beings who live in North Pole. We have human beings who live in deserts. So maybe we can understand that human beings could accept the change and the global warming more than they try to keep it stable as it is because history has shown that the more we interfere, the more we don't understand the impact. I mean, we are spending some money on adaptation at this point, and there's far more of a focus on it than there was even a decade or two ago. At one point, a lot of policymakers and a lot of NGOs said, let's not talk about adaptation because it'll detract from focusing on reducing our emissions. Uh, we finally realized, of course, that it wasn't an either or. We weren't really going to reduce our emissions enough to get us to where we needed to be and that we were going to have to adapt to a lot of the inevitable impacts of climate change as a consequence. And so there's been more of a prioritization of adaptation in international regimes, such as the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement than there was before. Having said that, we absolutely don't spend enough. And a lot of the commitments that developed countries have made in this context, even the modest commitments commitments haven't been fulfilled. And there's a number of reasons for this. First of all, a lot of the, the need for adaptation, primarily, at least at this point, are in developing countries. And most of the 
financial flows have to come from developed countries. And it's very difficult politically to sell transfers of funds from your country, especially in times with increasing financial constraints to other countries, including developing countries. So it becomes a very political issue. Second of all, as you've suggested, there's questions of whether money will be used efficiently. And that's a major question and institutions need to be set up for that. And third of all, it's not entirely clear in a lot of cases what adaptive responses are going to make the most sense, especially, again, because at the regional level, we're often not entirely certain what we're going to see in the future, even if some areas are going to see increased precipitation or decreased precipitation, for example. So how do you know what adaptation protocols are going to make the most sense and how much you should spend on them? So the science is difficult and the politics are difficult. I would answer the question in a slightly different way, which is to think about human adaptation in different ways than what we know and what we don't. The first part of your question was about, it seems that we don't know that much, don't know enough about the climate system. And that's true to an extent, but think about how much we know and don't know about the human body. We don't have a perfect model of the human body that allows us to fix all cancers and fix all health issues. There's a lot of complexity in there. But we do know, for example, if we heat the body up to 50 degrees, you're going to die. So we don't let that happen. So there are still some control that you can know quite a bit without knowing everything about the details and the nuances. And I think that's where it comes. That's the difference between knowing that climate change and allowing the planet to continue to heat up is going to have a lot of potential negative impacts on biodiversity, on ecosystems as they currently exist. And leads to the question of, well, wouldn't it be better to keep the temperature from going up and therefore shouldn't we consider climate solar geoengineering? So there is enough understanding in a broad sense to have the debate, but the details, the devil's in the details, and that's where we don't know as much, just as in medical science. Now, in terms of adaptation, you are absolutely correct. We adapt as human beings. And in fact, we've evolved as an incredibly adaptive species. And there's been lots of climate changes over the last 100,000 years, ice ages and periods of coming out of ice ages and back into them that Homo sapiens have evolved throughout. But it's important to think about the time scale of evolution. The time scales on which we've adapted to different environments, to living in Europe from the savanna and moving out to Asia and North America and through the ice ages, we've had hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to those differing conditions and develop that type of adaptivity. And if climate change were happening on a time scale of 200 years even, and it was a slow, gradual process of 200 years, one could imagine gradually planning to abandon cities that were on the coast and gradually move back to allow the sea level rise to simply consume Manhattan, for example. However, it's hard to convince people who are invested in Manhattan property and live there and live their lives there that they are going to have to move out during their lifetime and take their kids with them. This isn't a 200-year process. And a lot of the challenges of adaptation actually come down to the fact that we've now got 7 billion going on 9 billion people on the planet, and it ultimately will require moving a lot of people around. If climate change continues, and Greenland ice sheet melts, Greenland will be one of the most fertile areas for growing food. Nobody lives there. Then everyone has to move. And it's a relocation and transition on a scale that is unprecedented in terms of how we think about, you know, when we think about migration today and the fact that we've got refugees and migrants, imagine that on a scale that's 10 or 100 times larger. And you start to think about the types of adaptation or the way societies would need to adapt. And that comes with a lot of pain and suffering. Great. So what I'm hearing from Jason is I should sell my Bitcoin and buy property in Greenland. So I'm going to go ahead and do that after this call. Why hasn't the topic of climate engineering gained more traction in popular culture? Uh, Sure, every few months there's an article reintroducing the topic. And it's true. Recently, there was, a, I don't know if you guys have heard about this brainless disaster film, Geostorm, but still, it hasn't entered the zeitgeist in a way that would pressure politicians into taking any dramatic steps, Manhattan Project, uh, or anything like that. Why is that, do you think? Maybe, Will, you could take that on. You have an institute that perhaps is attempting to make this happen. <laughs> Movies like Geostorm and The Day After Tomorrow and Snowpiercer and The Colony in some ways by trivializing these issues and making them seem so extreme, probably detract from any kind of realistic discussion of what the actual deployment of these technologies would look like. I also think 
that there is an aversion on the part of politicians to large-scale intentional interventions of this nature that potentially have very serious negative implications, and they don't want to take that on. In some ways, of course, that's disingenuous. What we are doing in terms of climate change is large-scale intervention in the planet that's altering the climatic system. But it's not an intentional decision in the same way that GEO would with the kind of political implications that that would have. And I think politicians are averse to taking on those kind of intentional decisions with these kind of implications. A sin of commission as opposed to a sin of omission. Yes, I'm familiar with that in finance as well. There's a different risk-reward instinct that goes into your brain when you're thinking about those. So, sorry, uh, go ahead, Jason. I think Will is entirely right. I think there are two added factors. One, the scale of other problems that are dominating the news that are just perceived to be so much more urgent and in many ways are urgent in people's minds and political minds. Government, there's a transition of away from the stability of the 90s through the noughties into a seemingly much less geopolitically stable world. And that means a lot of conversations that would be required for more coordination, for more collaboration, just don't get into the zeitgeist. But the second thing is, who should have this conversation who would have this conversation? I frequently have discussions with politicians and political advisors who say, this is incredibly interesting, but it's not part of my file. This isn't something that I would take on. Even an environment minister feels it's in some ways possibly too big for them, but it's not quite a foreign minister. And at a head of state level, there are so many other things. So there is a big challenge with what desk should this sit on and who would ultimately be considered responsible for it. It's not that different from what we're seeing, though, with concerns about AI technologies and who ultimately in different governments is responsible for managing the digital portfolio and the emergence of the Internet of Things, the emergence of AI. The difference there is you can see the AI, you can see the physical manifestations of those technologies of the Internet of Things in your home and the momentum with which those technologies are evolving right in front of people and in the news is just so much faster that then it creates more impetus for government to respond. I think these slow burn problems are much more difficult to bring to the front of the agenda. Thank you very much for that response. Regarding AI and how tangible the impacts or responsibilities in case of damage are, I'm thinking about the parallel to our discussion earlier about uncomparability of, for example, for fatal events. This opens up a new discussion I would love to have now, but I also think we are over time and this is kind of a nice ending actually, because it proves that it is a good idea to cover this topic now here on the show. Thank you all for a highly interesting discussion. We covered many topics from techniques to ethics to politics and got some really cool insights about the current situation as well as potential future scenarios. Would you like to say something about how people can find more about you too? Jason, you go ahead. Well, more information about the work that we do in my department at UCL, Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy is available at the UCL website. If you just search UCL Steep, S-T-E-A-P-P, They'll find information not only about what we do on climate, but also on urbanization and on big data and AI and a whole range of other technology and policy type issues. Thanks very much. How about you, Will? So we're at the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment. Our URL is ceassessment.org. And our website includes reports on our governance work and our public participation work, as well as a lot of resources on geoengineering, including overviews of the technologies and some of the discussions of the issues that we've talked about today. Okay, thanks. That was it with our Let's Make the Future episode about geoengineering. Good day and good night, respectively, everybody. And thanks for listening. Yeah, from my perspective as well, thank you very much also. And on behalf of everyone else as well, thank you so much for taking the time either this morning or this evening. I guess it's this morning uh, for most of you. So uh, yeah, have a great day. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Let's make the future. Visit us online at letsmakethefuture.com.